Greetings collectors and welcome to today's retro game review. You join us at the start of the Sega Saturn Capcom Fighter miniseries. No matter your age or platform of choice, I think we can all agree that Capcom have produced some outstanding fighting games over the years. The problem is that the Capcom 2D fighter universe is not just a single series, it's a whole history of overlapping crossovers, cameos, remakes, nonsensical additions, same games by a different name, and regional exclusives. I had looked at making an end-to-end -end Street Fighter miniseries, covering all of the games to date, but when I saw just how many games, editions and formats there are, I just couldn't imagine that there's enough space on the YouTube servers to handle it all. Instead, I'd like to take you on a more manageable journey of the 2D Capcom fighter games officially released for the Sega Saturn. So here are the rules of the series. I'll be looking at all sequential, non-spin-off titles released on the system, that means no Puzzle Fighter or the anime movie game. The series won't cover the other Capcom 32-bit series, such as the Street Fighter EX series. To keep things simple, I'll also largely be keeping to the Japanese editions of the games. North America and Europe also received most of the same games on this list, although often under different names. Most notably, the Street Fighter Zero series became Street Fighter Alpha outside of Japan. This means we're also going to have some great fun when it comes to the naming conventions of characters, particularly in the Street Fighter series. Those of you that collect Japanese Street Fighter games will already know this, but for my Western audience, here are some quick explanations. In Japan, M. Bison is known as Vega. Vega is known as Balrog. And Balrog is known as M. Bison. In Japan, Akuma is also known as Goki. Evil Ryu occasionally translates to something closer to Dark Ryu, depending on the source material. In short, the Street Fighter reviews in this series are almost certainly going to generate comments of why the names are all over the place. Welcome to Capcom. In this episode, I'd just like to take the time to explain the chronology of the Sega Saturn library. I'll be featuring the Street Fighter series, the Street Fighter crossover series, the Marvel series, as well as the Dark Stalkers series, known as the Vampire series in Japan. If you're a modern gamer looking back at Capcom's back catalogue, it can be difficult to understand how each series evolved and how interlinked they are. As such, I'd like to share the context of the timeline and if it's worth your while collecting these games today. Whilst it was the 16-bit era that was the true origin of many of these series, I personally found that it was the 32-bit era that really shaped how the series would look in the years to come. So, first up on the timeline, Street Fighter the movie. This game had the unenviable task of ushering Street Fighter onto the Sega Saturn platform. Not only is the presentation unconventional, but it also has the distinction of being based on a movie of the same name, based on the game. And here is that movie, the 1994 Jean-Claude Van Damme Raoul Julia romp that left us slightly baffled as to why Ryu and Ken were con artists, Blanca looks like the Elephant Man's green cousin, and why Julia never won the Oscar for the most insane acting as a movie villain ever. I have the DVD here, but more on this in another episode. Those 3.8 stars on IMDb can wait. It was 1995, the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn fans looked forward to a new Street Fighter game for the next generation. What we received didn't go down too well. The movie source material had taken a few liberties with the Street Fighter universe and was panned by critics. For what it's worth, I find the movie a bit of a rather satisfying disaster. It's fun for all the wrong reasons. How would it translate to the 32-bit platform though as a game? In short, not well. Street Fighter 2, Turbo Editions and Championship Editions had all dominated the arcade and found their way into our home collections. The decision to change the presentation style was perhaps the first issue. Compared to the more cartoon-like classic Street Fighter, the game suffers twofold. Firstly, the digitised sprites look very jagged in places. They also seem to have very few frames of animation. It just makes the game feel very cheap. The sprites appear washed out and even the background animations have very limited frame rates. We had already seen gaming rivals such as Mortal Kombat get this right on the 16-bit consoles, so why the execution was so below par here remains a mystery. Secondly comes the issue of the sprites themselves. 
We're so used to seeing the characters in a certain way, any change is likely to be met with suspicion. Just look at Blanca for example. Compared to his classic appearance, there's few that will prefer the movie incarnation. The game adaptation did allow Capcom to experiment with the story mode. Playing as Guile, you follow the cutscenes and decide on a route to take on your way to defeat Bison. It's a good idea in principle, but having established that it's not really a plot that drives Street Fighter, it's not a huge bonus for the game. There is of course the classic Street Fight mode that plays very much as you would expect a Street Fighter game. Select your character and then come up against a rather well fleshed out roster of fighters. This is where things get noticeably bad. The game very much seems like the black sheep of the Street Fighter series. For some reason it just doesn't feel like a Street Fighter game. It's a bit unbalanced, the hitboxes are not quite where you think they ought to be and overall this turns into a button masher rather than any reliance on fighting strategy. To be fair to the game, it isn't terrible. You can certainly find worse fighting games out there. The issue is that this isn't just any fighting game, this is Capcom's premier fighting series and rightly or wrongly it will always be measured by the other games that preceded it. So far, Capcom hadn't ushered in the 32-bit era of fighting games with any finesse, but that was about to change. Capcom's next release would see them team up with the Marvel license to re-establish themselves as the arcade fighting kings. 1995 had already seen the release of Street Fighter the movie, the game, and Capcom fans had been left a little flat by the experience. The same year though, we also knew that Capcom's new fighter would be out, X-Men Children of the Atom. Now Children of the Atom had already been out in the arcades, so it came as no surprise to anyone that this was going to be a great game on the Sega Saturn. 2D fighting games were something of a forte for Sega's black box and the conversion was excellent. Out of the gates you can play as 10 X-Men characters, well known characters such as Wolverine, Storm and Colossus, but also less known household characters such as Omega Red and Spiral. The game follows a similar style to Street Fighter in which you select a character and work your way through a list of opponents. What sets X-Men Children of the Atom apart though is its high octane energy. Sure, we had played Street Fighter Hyper Fighting, but Children of the Atom took all this to the next level. Larger sprites, the ability to jump to an extending screen and overall more exaggerated movesets. Children of the Atom gave Capcom the license to let their hair down and go bigger and better than any previous fighting game that they had put out into the mainstream. The nature of comic book heroes lends itself really well to this type of game and the game is still seen as an important entry in Capcom's back catalogue. Years later, you can still see many of the elements that this game introduced in their more modern titles. The game sounds fantastic, the tracks are uplifting when they need to be and suitably dramatic when there is call for showdowns with the bosses. The game just works really well. With the sound being excellent, it's fair to say that the graphics also lived up to expectations. Well animated, well detailed and vivid they leap off the screen even to this day. We've seen many incarnations of the characters over the years, but I'm pleased that Capcom and Marvel decided to go with the 90s cartoon of X-Men as the base template for their designs. In terms of gameplay, Children of the Atom feels reasonably well balanced. Silver Samurai can seem a bit overpowered, as does Omega Red. However, characters such as Psylocke are given extra speed advantages to compensate. Activating the special moves is always fun and it feels reasonably intuitive to get into as a fighter. The game isn't perfect by any means. Previous Capcom games always felt a little more contained. Children of the Atom literally lets you jump from one side of the screen to the other. It produces a very different experience to the Street Fighter series. Everything feels a lot more exaggerated, noisy and at times slightly messy as a fighting experience. After a while you sink into the game and get used to it, but this is perhaps a game that does take some level of mastery to get the best out of. Overall though, Children of the Atom is a landmark game and well worth picking up. The physical presentation is spot on. The cover artwork is typically marvellous and this all flows through onto the CD artwork and of course the well presented manual stocked with useful player by player tips and movesets. 
the introduction of the outrageous combos and special moves made Children of the Atom a standout game of the year. Now, perhaps overshadowed by its sequel, Marvel Super Heroes, X-Men did prove above all things that Street Fighter now had a challenger from within its own house. With Street Fighter the movie having undermined the series, and Children of the Atom now the fan favourite on the Saturn, the ball was in Street Fighter's court. The following year, in 1996, the Street Fighter series would fight back. The Street Fighter team would fight back with a landmark entry in the series. The age of Street Fighter 2 had come to an end. The rise of Street Fighter Zero was coming. Big, bold and beautiful, X-Men had thrown the gauntlet down to the Street Fighter team to create an even better experience. In early 1996, the Sega Saturn would receive Street Fighter Zero, known as Street Fighter Alpha outside of Japan. Whilst not drastically different from the previous Street Fighter 2 entries in the series, there was definitely evolution here. The graphics have had an overhaul to a more appropriate 32-bit colour palette. The animations now more fluid and original stages added. Perhaps one of the most noticeable elements are the new characters, Birdie, Adon, Guy, Sodom, Nash and Rose. The game features only 10 playable characters without using unlock codes, so there's a clear shift away from the classic Street Fighter 2. From Street Fighter 2, only Ryu, Ken, Chun-Li remain, with Sagat now not considered a boss. Interestingly, Guy and Sodom arrive from another Capcom masterpiece, Final Fight. This was an early sign that the Capcom universe was beginning to overlap and knit together as a single entity. More on this in a later episode. Of the new characters, I find Rose perhaps the most interesting. Up until now, female fighters had all been quite stereotypical. Rose the fortune teller though, starts to branch out the types of fighter represented in the series. So, how does it play? The answer? Very well indeed. If you're used to the Street Fighter 2 series, then you'll have no issues at all in transitioning to the Zero Alpha series. The Sega Saturn edition is always best played on the Sega HSS 104 control stick. I've mentioned it before, but I can't recommend it enough. If you have a six button arcade fighting game in front of you, then this is perhaps the best option you will ever find. It's solid and built with the arcade in mind. It really is a game changer and so important so that you can roll semicircles for faster Hadoukens and Shuryukens. You're really going to have fun with this game. It very much feels like classic Street Fighter 2, but with a modern flavour. The combo system in itself isn't new to the series. However, the extent to which you can pull off manual and semi-automatic combos has been greatly refined. If you're the type of player that plays the points game, then there are bonus points available for ending on a super combo finish. It also looks rather impressive. In terms of a physical release, Street Fighter Zero is a bit of a mixed bag. The back cover works well with the game fighters. The main cover though, I'm not overly fond of, at least the Japanese edition. The alpha editions just seem to capture the feel of the game a little better. On the Japanese cover, Ryu looks the part, but Ken looks far more feminine than he's usually portrayed. The ponytail doesn't help, but generally he looks a bit different to normal. Nothing game-breaking at all though, and the cover is at least reasonably memorable. The manual makes up for this, as we see Ken kicking Ryu and much more representative of the Ken we all know. Chun-Li makes the game disc, and the overall presentation feels solid. The manual is really well put together with move sets for all the characters and some very nice illustrations of the characters. It's in the manual where you discover the move sets for Vega and Goki, known as Bison and Akuma outside of Japan. These characters are unlockable and become playable. There is also the character of Dan who is also unlockable via a code. As a game, Street Fighter Zero set a new bar for the series. It was one of the faster, more colourful entries to date, and really nothing to complain about at all. Sure, we had lost some of the classic Street Fighter 2 characters, but we had gained some new ones in their place. The improved combo system, special moves, power bars and crossover characters all subtly shifted Capcom's fighting game offering to the fans. These weren't dramatic changes, but little did we know, Capcom were not only programming games, but programming us, in preparation for where they wanted to take their games in the future. 
with Zero landing in January 1996. It then came as a welcome surprise that Street Fighter Zero 2 would also be arriving in the same year on the Sega Saturn that September. Capcom were taking things very seriously, and there was a real push to get people's minds back on Street Fighter. Rival series, such as SNK's King of Fighters, had become well established in the arcades and Sega Saturn by this point. Zero Two needed to not just slowly evolve the series, it needed to innovate. New combos, special moves and characters had all laid some very solid foundations for the series to grow in scale and ambition. Released in September 1996, the game came very quickly on the heels of Street Fighter Zero, having only been released in January of the same year. What could we expect from this entry in the series? More fighters? More special moves? More combos? Well, yes, basically all of that and a subtle lean towards a more exaggerated style of presentation. Let's get the obvious enhancements out of the way. The player roster now extends to 18 characters out of the gate, including previously unlockable characters from Street Fighter Zero, Goki, Vega and Dan, or Akuma, Bison and Dan in the Alpha series. Overall, the character assortment is a lot more diverse this time around. The notable additions in this release are Relento, Sakura, Dalsim, Jen and Zangief. Relento represents an emerging trend towards including characters from other Capcom series. You'll remember him as the grenade-throwing boss from Final Fight. Dalsim and Zangief, back as fan favourites, and Jen returns from the original Street Fighter game. Access to what were previous boss characters is a nice touch, and reminiscent of the Street Fighter Championship 2 edition features. Of the newly introduced characters, it's Sakura that is remembered for having the most impact. Generally, she plays a bit like a nimbler Ryu, having very much been his admirer in the game's backstory. Her easy-to-execute combos and powerful Hadoukens make her seem to punch above her weight when compared to other characters such as Dalsim. Zero Two generally feels a little bit more epic this time around. From my experience, I'd say that the game does play slightly faster than its predecessor and the animation just a little bit more fluid. There's not a lot in it, but it's clear that overall, the Zero series had been given a lot of attention for this sequel. The Sega Saturn edition does have an exclusive survival mode, which is a nice distraction, but it's the arcade mode that I find myself returning back to. The physical release of the game is very pleasing this time around. The cover artwork places the Ryu Sakura narrative up front, and there's a decent nod to the importance of Shin Guki, or Evil Guki if you prefer. It's a thread of Street Fighter that really started to come to the forefront in various associated comics and anime around about this time. As with its predecessors, the manual is really excellent. There's lots of detailed illustrations of the main characters, as well as all the movesets that you're likely to need, and also a decent explanation of how to pull off the specials at each power gauge level. For the CD, Sakura makes the cut this time around with a very pleasing pink CD design. The Saturn disc is the one to go for if you're a collector. It has a few extras such as the survival mode, but also includes bonus illustrations to flick through. It's not a game changer, but it is always good to own what would be considered the most complete version of a Street Fighter game. Perhaps the biggest advantage over the PlayStation version though, are the extra frames of animation. The Sega Saturn version is considered the technically superior version, and at the time of its release, considered the closest conversion from the original arcade hardware. All in all, unless you consider yourself a hardcore Capcom collector, the PlayStation version is still a good second option. Although the Sega HSS-104 control stick is an obvious deal breaker for me as to why you would always want to play fighting games on the Sega Saturn. So, the verdict. Personally, I do prefer Zero Two to its predecessor. It's a little bolder, whilst at the same time being more refined, with more characters, movesets and locations. It's not leaps and bounds ahead of Zero, but with the backstory of Ryu, Goki and their dark counterparts beginning to build, and access to more content, it does feel like a warranted sequel, and not just another occasion to add another number on the end of a popular game. 
the game allows you to configure difficulty levels, turbo settings and some degree of automatic combo. Overall, it's just a very solid game that most Capcom and Street Fighter fans will tell you is a really solid experience. With Street Fighter fans now happier with life on the Sega Saturn, it was time to address the elephant in the room for all Saturn fans. What about the other great Capcom series, Darkstalkers, sometimes known as the Vampire series in Japan? The Saturn dodged the question altogether first time around and didn't receive the first Darkstalkers game. We would have to wait until November 1996, just two months after Zero Two, to get our first glimpse of Capcom's horror fighting masterpiece, Darkstalkers Revenge. We saw how Street Fighter Zero Two set a new benchmark for Capcom fighters on the Sega Saturn. It was a well received title and put Street Fighter very much on the agenda as top dog in the fighting genre. Something had been bubbling away in the background though, a game we came to know as Darkstalkers 2 here in the west, but Vampire Hunter Darkstalkers Revenge in Japan. This is a game that took some time to get any traction outside of Japan, although I'm pleased to report that it is now much wider known today. There is a story to Darkstalkers mainly revolving around the Vampire Lord and a group of monsters that must defend Earth from the invading Dark Forces. As you might expect, it's all just a good excuse to have a good old fashioned dust up with monsters. Out of the box, there are 14 playable characters. The cast is really varied from Felicia the Cat Lady, Sasquatch, to various werewolf from Frankenstein's monster style characters. Perhaps the best known character though is the succubus, Morrigan. Since her appearance in the Darkstalkers series, she's made it into various other media including books, anime and of course the later Darkstalkers and Capcom vs games. Whether intended or not, she's become the best known face of the series. It's clear that this is not a Street Fighter clone due to the roster, but obviously shares a lot of similarities. The rounds play out in a very well established pattern of combos and special moves. Overall, there's nothing too groundbreaking in the gameplay to make it stand out over Children of the Atom or the Zero series. As such, Darkstalkers has always been the Capcom series on the outside and has never really hit the mainstream in say the way that the Marvel games or Street Fighter series have. That's not a bad thing though, and it's not as if Darkstalkers had to try hard as it does have its own particular fanbase. While the mainstream are off throwing fireballs and trying to outdo each other with fancy upgrades, Darkstalkers happily sits apart being its own entity. It doesn't have to live up to a huge franchise such as Marvel or receive the pressure that each Street Fighter release has to be the best and stay the best. No, Darkstalkers is its own world, has its own fans and has kept a very distinct feel to it. Looking at the graphics, it's clear that there is quite a bit of pixelation and certainly nowhere near the amount of polish that the Zero series has. What we are left with though is a unique feeling fighter. I first played Vampire Hunter many years ago when I was getting into the Japanese Sega Saturn library and I wasn't particularly blown away. If you're looking for the ultimate fighting game on the system then this just simply isn't it. However, something strange happened. Despite its quirks and low profile, I actually came to really appreciate the series. The game mechanics all work well, the movesets are simple and the character design is really well thought out. I want to say that Vampire Hunter is a bit of a guilty pleasure. I know it's not the best fighter, but I'm going to enjoy it anyway. It was only years later when compilations of the Darkstalkers series were released in Europe and North America did the game really hit not exactly the big time, but at least big to those who wanted to experience it. The game does tend to descend slightly into button bashing territory, particularly if you are playing with a friend, but it's button bashing of the best kind. Vampire Hunter is a really fun game. Capcom were able to make the game stable and balanced enough through their wealth of experience and let designers loose on rather outlandish character designs all because there was no pressure. Vampire Hunter is exactly the type of game that you can pull out around Halloween for some good old fashioned monster beat em up fun. The music in the game is excellent and has some particularly gothic tunes which should go down well if you're looking for some background atmosphere for Halloween. Vampire Hunter remains the surprise success in Capcom's Saturn library. It's quirky, has great personality 
and there's definitely fun to be had here. It wouldn't be until two years later in 1998 that we would get the sequel, Vampire Savior, also known as Darkstalkers 3 outside of Japan. First though, Capcom were going to get very busy with the Sega Saturn hardware by cramming three games into 1997. A Street Fighter game, a Marvel game, and a Street Fighter X-Men crossover game. Capcom's master plan was slowly revealing itself. We were getting ever closer to seeing the 32-bit Capcom universe unification. An era that paved the way to ensure that one day all Capcom fighters could be interchangeable. The last time we had seen a Capcom Marvel game on the Sega Saturn was X-Men Children of the Atom in 1995. Things were about to widen from the X-Men though into Marvel's wider catalogue in the legendary Marvel Super Heroes game. With a steady stream of popular Street Fighter games, a niche Darkstalkers fanbase, and an acclaimed Marvel hit, X-Men Children of the Atom, it was time for Capcom to revisit their Marvel license. The X-Men may form a significant part of Marvel's best known characters, but what about the rest? A spiritual successor to Children of the Atom was released in the form of Marvel Super Heroes. Today, the full influence of the game is now being understood in a wider context. Whilst it's fair to say that X-Men and Marvel in general were both mainstream brands, they were still somewhat in the domain of comic book and graphic novel fans. In 1996, we all knew the headliners such as Spider-Man, The Hulk, Wolverine and Captain America. However, how many of us really knew the supporting cast of characters such as Shuma Gorath unless you were a fan of the illustrated adventures? What Marvel superheroes did was engage a slightly wider audience and bring us into the Marvel Universe in a digestible way. I'd always enjoyed the 80s Spider-Man and Friends cartoon and the X-Men, but I wouldn't go as far as saying I was a fan. I was a follower of computer games and technology in general. In 1997, I'd be much more likely to be found upgrading my PC memory than reading a graphic novel. Marvel superheroes was the right game at the right time though. As you've probably guessed by now, I've always enjoyed a decent Capcom fighter. With Marvel Super Heroes being announced as somewhat of a sequel to Children of the Atom, I was part of the prime target audience. Marvel Super Heroes took away that slight stigma of the typical nerdy comic book reader and made Marvel cool, mainstream and accessible. Why is this so important you might ask? Well, in many ways we have this game to thank for the later interest in the Infinity War saga. You see, the premise of the game is very much to collect the six infinity gems representing power, time, space, mind, soul and reality, all with the aims of ensuring that the game's villain, Thanos, does not get hold of them. Sound familiar? Well, that's because it is. The game takes its central story from the 1992 comic from Marvel, Infinity War. This was the game that Capcom had been working towards. It was the culmination of bringing the X-Men and other Marvel characters together in a single fighter. Sort of an early unification of Marvel. This unification of Marvel would then later be echoed in the unification of Capcom itself in later console generations. History would repeat itself 21 years later with the 2018 blockbuster from Marvel, Infinity War. What had worked in the gaming world was sure to work on the big screen. Perhaps more about the movie another time, but for now I'll stick to the game. Now I'm not going into a huge backstory of Marvel, but it is important to know that Marvel Super Heroes does come up short when it comes to being a canon entry in the series. The Infinity War saga actually contains many unfeatured characters, such as Alpha Flight, Daredevil, Deathlock, Doctor Strange, Fantastic Four, Guardians of the Galaxy, Moon Knight, Quasar, Silver Sable and the Wild Pack, Silver Surfer, Sleepwalker, Wonder Man and plenty more that are absent within the game. As a note on this, Marvel licenses have long been an issue to unify the Marvel Universe. Big divisions such as the X-Men and the Fantastic Four being lent to 20th Century Fox, Spider-Man being licensed to Sony whilst other characters remained with Marvel but then subsequently bought out by Disney. At the time of making this episode, things are gradually getting back under one roof, but it is taking time. So, now you know why no one's in the X-Men school for gifted children when Deadpool visits. 
Anyway, this doesn't really affect the game. Back in 1997, I had no idea who Groot or Doctor Strange were, so ignorance is bliss. It's only in later years that an audience large enough to warrant this has emerged. Marvel Super Heroes itself really builds upon the success of Children of the Atom. The same energy is there, and the game looks and sounds absolutely beautiful. I hooked this up to my 42 inch screen, and I can confirm it still remains an excellent experience and really stays true to the arcade edition. As mentioned, during the fights you will be able to pick up the Infinity Gems. Each has a different property, such as increased attack speed and defense, and can be saved and used strategically throughout the battles. Careful though, as your opponent will also be collecting them. The gameplay is very easy to get into. It has the same unrealistic jumping as Children of the Atom, yet seems to feel a little bit more natural here. What I have here is the UK PAL edition of the game. Thankfully, this game was released in the more expensive black plastic case format, found later in the Sega Saturn's life cycle. It's really solid and also features some top-notch Marvel illustrations. Inside you get a really well presented game disc along with the manual. The manual artwork is really great and there are comic book style illustrations for each character and associated movesets. If I had one gripe it's that the manual is black and white inside, a full colour edition would really have been appreciated by the fans. Marvel Super Heroes plays really well and remains an important game for collectors, even more so than Children of the Atom. I think we can point to this game as directly influencing multiple games in the following years. The final showdown with Thanos is very memorable, and it was this game that made me notice Marvel, and my first encounter with the Infinity War saga. Marvel was not the only Capcom saga in 1997 though. 1996's Street Fighter Zero 2 had now come and gone. It was 1997 and Capcom needed to remind us all that Street Fighter was still the champion of the arcades. At the same time though, they wanted to re-establish their gaming legacy. That's why the Street Fighter Collection, featuring three games on two discs, was issued. Were Capcom running out of ideas though, and just repackaging old goods, or was this an honest attempt to showcase their best work? We saw how Capcom were able to improve on the X-Men Children of the Atom formula with the stunning sequel Marvel Super Heroes. The game introduced us to the Infinity Gem system and also laid down an ominous message to Street Fighter that along with Vampire Hunter, Street Fighter wasn't the only game to be evolving at the company. With excellent Street Fighter Zero and Zero Two games in the bag for the Sega Saturn owners, it was time for Capcom to fall back on their Street Fighter legacy. The Street Fighter Alpha Zero series at the time were a step up in the opinion of many gamers. However, the 32-bit generation were in danger of becoming cut off from the roots of the franchise. If you began your gaming career in the 32-bit era, the only representation of classic characters like Guile, E Honda and Blanca were from the Street Fighter movie game. I think we can all agree that was not a good place to be in. Capcom had a couple of options for fans, a Street Fighter Zero 3 release with more characters and original stages, or a re-release of the classic games for the 32-bit consoles. A third Street Fighter Zero entry in the series at this stage would almost certainly be seen as a little bit of overkill. Releasing three sequential games in quick succession would likely have been popular with the hardcore fans, but for most stumping up money for three Street Fighter games in two years perhaps wouldn't have been the right move. The alternate option would be to re-release a previous 16-bit edition of the game. Although we've seen time and time again the backlash of re-releasing Street Fighter games to the point it became a joke in the late 90s. The series is confusing enough without introducing titles such as Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo X-0 Alpha Hyper Fighting Rainbow Edition. In my opinion, Capcom made a very wise choice. They chose to release a collection of Street Fighter games on two CDs, simply known as the Street Fighter Collection. I'm looking specifically at the Japanese version here, and some of the naming conventions of the games contained within will differ outside of Japan. So, what do you get in here exactly? Well, you get three games. On disc one, arcade ports of Super Street Fighter 2 The New Challengers and Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, 
also known as Street Fighter 2X Grandmaster Challenge. On Disc 2, we find Street Fighter 02 Dash. For those outside of Japan, the game is known as Street Fighter Alpha 2 Gold. Essentially, it's the definitive edition of the arcade edition of Street Fighter 02. Let's start with Super Street Fighter 2 though. Out of the box, you get all 16 playable characters from the arcade, plus the option of unlocking other characters. I have to say that the game looks great, and as far as I can tell, this looks to be a direct port from the arcade hardware. Everything here is well animated, the sounds are crisp, and I'd be quite content if this was the only game in the collection. One feature the game does omit though, is the turbo settings, which are now a staple of Capcom fighting games. This is why the disc also contains Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo Edition. Again, the game features the default 16 characters plus unlockables, such as Akuma or Goki in the Japanese edition. There's even unlockable outfits if you prefer the classic Street Fighter look. This time around, there's a bit more content thrown in and is technically the better game. The main draw obviously being able to now select up to 4 turbo speeds. The games are very similar. I actually prefer the menus in Super Street Fighter 2, but the added content of Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo makes it the obvious choice for most. All in all though, pick your favourite and have some fun. Right, on to Disc 2. Street Fighter Alpha 2 Gold outside of Japan, Street Fighter 02 Dash in Japan. For this review, I'll just be referring it to Dash, as I'm aware that I've said Street Fighter about 50 times now. Perhaps a drinking game is in order, a shot for every time you hear the word Street Fighter, and a pint for every fireball. You may remember from my recent Street Fighter 02 review, I very much enjoy this entry in the series. What's presented here in Dash is still a great game. If I'm honest, the extra touches, frames of animation, and supposed enhancements are all a little lost on me. If you have 02, then there's no real need to upgrade to Dash. As you might expect, the game is packed full of additional extras, such as the first appearance of Kami in the Zero series. However, she's only available as an unlockable character. In the Japanese edition, select Vega and beat the game, and ensure that you play well enough to gain the top score on the rankings. Once you've completed the game by taking down Ryu, enter your name as C-A-M. Now, when you re-enter to play, highlight Vega and press the start button until Kami becomes available. No longer in her traditional green, this is a model of Kami we would see again on the Sega console. More of this in the next episode though. From there, you'll be able to play as Kami and pull off all of those great combos. There's also another good reason as to why Capcom would want you to unlock Kami, and that's because it means you have to complete the game as Vega, or Bison outside of Japan. Completing the game as Vega means you get to see an important plot point of the series, the creation of Evil Ryu. Essentially a souped up version of the regular Ryu, but has more in common with the Goki Akuma character. This is emphasised by the additional Goki mode on the disc. Select this option to face off against Goki. Be warned though, he really packs a punch and is exactly the type of challenge you need if you're a long term fan of the series. It also pushes the narrative forward for the series. We're in 1997 and the story of the evil versions of characters is now established and now slotted much more definitively into the existing Vega Ryu storyline. This was then expanded in several animes. It's worth drawing a conclusion at this point that the Street Fighter collection will keep you happy as a game collection. Two great Super Street Fighter 2 variants and also the definitive edition of Zero 2. However, for Street Fighter collectors, the release actually raises a few questions. In a logical world, you would want to release all the previous back catalogue in a meaningful sequential order. Here is roughly how the Street Fighter 2 universe looked at the end of 1996. I've distilled this down into the major arcade and home releases, although the eagle-eyed of you will notice that variants such as the Rainbow Edition have been removed for my own sanity. Essentially, you have the standard Street Fighter 2 games, followed by the Super and Turbo editions, ending in the Tournament editions. The Street Fighter collection includes the Super edition and its Turbo equivalent. This misses out many of the earlier releases. The collection also includes Zero 2 Dash, which is an odd place to start. Why not start at Zero 1? 
The answer to this is to perhaps spread the appeal of the games to gamers. The games selected are certainly great, it's just that as a collection it's neither one thing or another, and certainly far from complete. This would be remedied somewhat by the Capcom Generations 5 disc containing Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior, the original Street Fighter 2, Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition, Street Fighter 2 Dash in Japan, and Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyper Fighting, Street Fighter 2 Dash Turbo in Japan. This is all a bit academic now anyway, as later generations have plugged all of the major gaps. Later series such as 3, 4, 5, as well as various special editions and regional differences would muddy the waters to the point where a full review is near impossible. What I can say though is that the Saturn collection is excellent. It's got a little bit of old school and a good dose of the modern, making it the go-to purchase if you were standing in front of the game shelf in 1997. Things were about to shift direction again though for Capcom. We touched on the idea of a Capcom Universe unification in the previous episode. This idea was about to get kicked off its hinges by late 1997 in perhaps the most important Capcom fighting game of the 32-bit era. It was time that two worlds collided, as the first Capcom crossover game was released, X-Men vs Street Fighter. A game so large it was even supplied with its own 4 megabyte memory cartridge. X-Men vs Street Fighter! We saw how Capcom were able to consolidate the Street Fighter series in the Street Fighter collection, a rather neat 3 game package of the old and the new. By November 1997, the X-Men universe and Street Fighter universe were both well established with gamers. Capcom decided that it was time that they squared up to each other in a single game, in X-Men vs Street Fighter. It's perhaps best to start with the physical release of the game, as it is somewhat different to the normal Capcom releases. Although you can buy a single game edition, the game was also used to promote the expanded 4 megabyte memory cartridge for the Sega Saturn. The extra memory enabled smoother graphics with extra frames of animation, and just all out helped push the capability of the system. The game case and manual are all to the fine standard of the Capcom Saturn releases, and overall this feels like a collection in itself. Out of the box expect 16 playable characters from the world of Street Fighter and X-Men. You could now have epic lineups such as Kami vs Juggernaut. The specials are in here, as well as an excellent combo system. What really set this one apart though was the tag system. This was a two on two affair, select your team of any two of the characters and face off against your opponents. When things start getting tough against a certain opponent, switch out and use your teammate. This mechanic in itself drastically changed the way we played Capcom fighting games. It provided variation and more tactics than previously available. The other element to notice here is the scrolling convention. Up until this point in time, all Street Fighter games had no vertical scrolling. No matter how high you jumped or were thrown in the air, the camera would remain locked. This was in stark contrast to both Children of the Atom and Marvel Super Heroes lines of games. Interestingly, X-Men vs Street Fighter opts for the vertical screen scrolling, as well as character designs more in line with the Marvel games. So in fact, Although the game is titled X-Men vs Street Fighter, the game is very much designed as Street Fighter characters in a game using Marvel gaming conventions. This soon becomes apparent, as the game is brighter and bolder than the Zero series, moves are more exaggerated, and the game itself feels as if it should fit within the Marvel universe of games. Although a bit of a mashup in styles, it's incredible how well the two Capcom worlds unite. The game feels very well balanced, and it's certainly a triumph for the first Versus game in the series. Its importance in gaming history shouldn't be overlooked. This was the origin of a whole branch of games for Capcom. We would see Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter, Street Fighter vs Tekken, Marvel vs Capcom, and even Tatsunoku vs Capcom. X-Men vs Street Fighter was a game that really spoke to gamers and Marvel fans. It delivered the excitement and energy of the Marvel style with the sophistication and experience of a Street Fighter game. This truly is a best in class game on the Sega Saturn and I can't recommend it highly enough. 1997 was coming to an end though. We had seen excellent outings from Street Fighter and Marvel. 
There was, however, a third voice, still wanting to be heard in the background. Away from the spotlight, a horror was calling to gamers. By April 1998, Capcom unleashed Vampire Savior, the Lord of Vampires, on the Sega Saturn. We saw how Capcom were able to cross worlds with the epic X-Men vs Street Fighter. Street Fighter and Marvel were now quite literally going head to head. Capcom's other franchise of Darkstalkers was bubbling along quite nicely in the background. April 1998 saw the release of Vampire Savior Lord of Vampires on the Sega Saturn. The game features 18 characters all with a monstrous style. The original cast are back, but with a new collection of even stranger characters. Its predecessor, Vampire Hunter, was a great game, simple and fun. Vampire Savior really ups the presentation and energy levels. Characters have wider movesets, blocks, and most noticeable, the combo system has been reworked. To power all of this, the game also makes use of the 4 megabyte expanded memory cartridge. So, if you'd previously bought X-Men vs Street Fighter, you're already reaping the benefits of superior games. The plot to Darkstalkers does continue in this game, although not particularly relevant, save for the cutscenes at the end of each playthrough. It revolves around the villain Jeddah looking to save the world by creating a new dimension, called Magigen. It's all a bit far-fetched. Needless to say, the fighters of the underworld have various interests in ensuring that the world as they know it doesn't end. Much like Vampire Hunter, the game keeps to what it does best, and that's engaging high-speed fights, very much relying on its theme to differentiate itself. As much as I enjoy Vampire Hunter, Vampire Savior is by far the better game. Real thought has gone into the planning this time to deliver an experience that feels much more like a game that wants to be seen. It's always difficult to know whether to recommend a game or not. If you do enjoy 90s fighting games, then I think you know exactly what you're getting yourself in for. The gameplay is nowhere near as technical as the Street Fighter series, and much darker in tone than the Marvel games. Vampire Savior is a game that I will happily come back to again and again though. It's very easy going and very easy to pick up. There's enough of a challenge and variation though to keep you entertained for some time. Whilst the game is guilty of having a rather pixelated aesthetic, there is no denying that the character designs themselves are perhaps some of the best from the era. For that alone, I would suggest investigating this title. It's a real shame that Darkstalkers never really hit the mainstream when it was first released. Of all the characters, Morrigan has enjoyed the best notoriety, being featured in anime and various other Capcom crossover games. With Vampire Savior not really packing much of a punch on the Saturn outside of Japan, Capcom looked to fall back on another versus game. This time around, it wasn't just X-Men, it was Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter. We saw how Capcom were able to still branch out with the Vampire series in Japan. An enjoyable series in its own right, but never really gained the sales figures that Capcom were looking for. None of that mattered though, as another Versus game was on the way. X-Men vs Street Fighter had been a universal hit. In October of 1998, Capcom released a bigger and better follow-up in the stunning Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter. The energy from this game is simply stunning. The bright lights, the announcer, and fluid graphics made the game an instant success in Japan. As you can tell from this intro, the game was very much looking to attract gamers to play. This time out, you'll have 18 characters to choose from, including one very special exclusive in the way of Norimaro. More on him later though. As with the previous Versus game, you select two players to face off against your opponents. 
The tag team element reintroduces the importance of strategy, and picking your fighters becomes an important element within the game. The fights are action-packed, and there are bonuses for finishing with a special move. Perhaps a Shinku Hadouken? Or why not a Masatsu Gore Shoryu? But surely the best finisher in the game, the Ultra Variety Private Memories. So this is Noromaro. I remember thinking when this game came out, who on earth is this guy? Belonging to neither the Capcom, Marvel or Street Fighter universes, Noromaro is a bit of a one-off. He's essentially a comedy creation of Noritake Kinashi, a well-known Japanese comedian. There is a documentary of how Noromaro came to be in the game, but sadly only in Japanese language. Sadly, Noromaro is only in the Japanese edition, due to licensing agreements, and yet another good reason to own the physical copies of games. In terms of the physical release, the cover artwork is very well put together, and all of that great design we've come to know and love from Capcom Fighter series. Noromaro makes the back cover as a way of making up for not featuring on the front cover. As with the entire series, the manual is very competent in showing each of the characters' moves and the general game mechanics needed to play. Of all the Saturn releases at the time, it was this game that I was most impressed with. The game is so fast and action-packed, it made the arcade experience really leap into your home. The game also evolves the character stories and universe for later entries. You'll end up fighting Apocalypse, giving a satisfying conclusion to the Marvel element of the story. You'll then take on what I believe is the first ever appearance of Mecha Goki, a fine moment in gaming history in itself. There's perhaps not much more I can say about Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter, it's simply a best in class of this type of game. I personally don't feel that it was bettered until the Marvel vs Capcom series that came much later on more powerful systems. For the Sega Saturn though, this is a must buy item for any serious fan of the genre. 1998 was now coming to a close. Capcom did release Capcom Generations as a compilation of some of the earlier Street Fighter 2 releases. I've chosen not to cover them here, as they really are just repetition of the classic 16-bit era. We see out the last game in the Street Fighter series with the phenomenal Street Fighter 03. How Marvel vs. Street Fighter created a lasting legacy and thrilled Sega Saturn owners. With the life of the Sega Saturn now coming to an end, 1998 saw the last Street Fighter game released in the way of Street Fighter 03. Right from the start, it's clear that the Zero series was going to end on a high. The intro is action packed and feels larger and somehow more serious than the other entries in the series. One significant upgrade is the number of playable characters. Now up to 34, plus unlockable variations, this is a significant leap up from its predecessor. The second element is the notion of an ism system. You can now select from X, Z or V style of gameplay. X style is a somewhat simplified mode of accessing the super power-up, whilst Z is more of a traditional zero style of fighting, with three distinct levels of super combo. 
The V-ism is a varied fighting style that allows custom combos. This all takes some time to sink in and quite a departure from the previous entries in the series. I tend to stick with the X or Z settings though. In general, the game feels great to play. The game has huge amounts of content and variation, so you're going to have hours of fun getting to grips with this one. It is perhaps the definitive moment in the Zero range of games. It has everything the previous two entries in the series had and more. The visuals are spectacular and has one of the best soundtracks of the entire series. As such, it often carries a very high price tag of thousands of yen. It looks good, sounds good, and by most accounts is the best edition of the game. Interestingly, even though the Dreamcast also saw a release of the game, I've often heard it said that most collectors prefer the Sega Saturn edition. I do own a demo of Zero 3 for the Dreamcast and found them to be reasonably similar. I'll stick with the Saturn edition though, just so I can spend more time with the Sega HSS 104 control stick. Street Fighter Zero 3 has another trick up its sleeve though. It's not just the graphics, audio and control system that have been polished. You'll also benefit from extra game modes outside of the standard arcade mode, such as Survival Mode, World Tour, Dramatic Battle and Final Battle. World Tour and Survival Modes are very much as you might expect and just a variation on the standard game. However, Dramatic Battle Mode offers something a little bit different. It offers a simultaneous one-on-two fight, something previously omitted from earlier games. At first, the mode is somewhat of a novelty, but actually becomes a mode that you'll want to play through, rather than just being a nice-to-have feature. It's not always easy, but it is perhaps the most action-packed mode there is in the entire Street Fighter series. The final battle mode is a real challenge for any Street Fighter veteran. Choose your character and face off against Vega. Be warned though, he is maxed out with the highest amount of block and given the advantage of a full super power meter. This is a mode very much aimed at the professionals and those looking to take their skills to the next level. Vega will deal out high amounts of damage per hit and loves to finish with a super combo attack. Overall though, this is an epic way to end the Street Fighter Zero series. So there you have it, the end of our journey through Capcom's fighting games on the Sega Saturn. From a rather dubious start with the Street Fighter movie game, to the Marvel standalone games and a rather great alternative universe of horror in Darkstalkers. We've seen crossovers, hidden characters, and a 32-bit generation that helped re-establish Capcom as makers of fine fighting games. With so much to choose from on the Sega Saturn though, I feel that I owe you a recommendation, so here it goes. If I could only have one game from the list, it would be Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter. It just has everything, the combos, the sound, graphics, and cast to back this one all up as a best in class. As a close second option, I'd have to recommend the Street Fighter Collection. It doesn't work as a collection as such, but two classic games plus the rework Zero Two makes this an easy choice for anyone looking to dip their toes into the world of Street Fighter. I'd also have to give a very well-deserved nod to Vampire Savior. It's something a bit different. Where Street Fighter games tend to blend together over time, Vampire Savior has a much more memorable cast of characters and a unique identity, so well worth considering for some Halloween fun. Of all the Capcom games on the Sega Saturn, the only one that I would happily give away for free is Street Fighter the Movie. It just doesn't work as a game, part of the series, or a true collectible. Every other game is of a really good solid standard though, so you can't go wrong whichever you decide to get off the shelf, dust off and fire up. I'd just like to say thank you all for sticking with this 11 part series, as there was a lot to get through, but I do hope you enjoyed getting reacquainted with this particular slice of Capcom Saturn history. I'm sure that you will all have lots of opinions on the series, so feel free to leave a message in the comments section. I know that Capcom fans are incredibly dedicated, so it would be great to hear which entries you would consider to be the most fun. Until next time, happy gaming! Hello again, I hope you enjoyed today's show and thank you for the view. 
Remember, you can always comment, like, subscribe, and find us on the social media sites below. Happy collecting!